scholars, elders, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We welcome you this evening during this blessed month of Ramadan for the next discussion in the series. We're very grateful to have Samantha Sayyid Sulaiman with us this evening to uh, carry on the uh, topics, the discussions, and the debates. Um, tonight's topic, officially as published, is um, halal food and precautions. Um, so inshallah, we'll be discussing topics underneath the overall subject. Um, we've lined up a couple of general ideas, but please feel free if you think you have any comment, follow-up question, anything that's pressing you, raise your hand, feel free to pipe in, and inshallah, we can incorporate um, comments from the audience as well. So it's so hopefully we can have kind of an open forum um, with a loose energy discussion format. Good? Sound good? Excellent. All right, so it's Thank you for joining us this evening. We're very grateful to have you. Um, so to, to get going, you know, we, we understand the purpose of salat and psalm and zakat. Those are all pretty clearly um, spiritual practices. We can see why prayer is important for akhir as well as for dunya. But when it comes to you know, things like food or dress that seem you know, practical, um, they don't seem on the face of it inherently spiritual endeavors. So I guess the, the first question I want to pose is, is the way in which we nourish ourselves a spiritual practice along with salat and psalm, um, or is it a purely practical thing? And if it is spiritual, why? So the question was that uh, uh, is food and drink uh, more of a practical issue or is it a spiritual issue? And um, to answer that question, uh, I want to uh, introduce two different ways that we can understand spiritual realities. And, uh, in general, spiritual realities are somewhat more difficult for us to relate to than uh, empirical realities, than things that we can uh, gather with our senses because our senses, they're immediate for us. It doesn't take a lot of effort uh, in order for us to be able to perceive things with our eyes, with our ears, and so on. Uh, but with our uh, spiritual reality, uh, it's not that clear to us at all times. Now, although it's not clear, that doesn't mean it's not important or it's not real. In some cases, the importance is greater, but we need to use some other means to approach it. One means that we can use uh, is our intellect. So for example, uh, if I want to appreciate why it is that God might uh, punish a person uh, in the hereafter, then I can use my intellect to determine uh, whether this is a belief that is reasonable or not. Does it go against my intellect or not? And quickly, this intellect is uh, independent from experience. Uh, the, the, the intellect is certainly um, informed by and honed by experience, but it operates independently. It operates above experience. That brings data that our intellect is able to uh, process, data that our, that our intellect uh, is able to uh, derive general rulings from and sometimes derive new material from. So uh, the intellect will need data that comes from our senses and our experience, but it is above that. And it operates uh, in many ways independently of that. There are some uh, some things that we can understand from our intellect that don't require any experience at all. Now, that method of using the intellect can be useful. And it has a place. But sometimes, we also have to use in other means. And that means is to compare spiritual realities to empirical realities. 
And that comparison, it's not an argument. It's not going to prove something, but it often makes things a lot easier to understand. Like if I want to understand, for example, spiritual health and sickness, I can use my intellect to derive certain principles. But I can also use a comparison with physical health and sickness. And the Quran does that frequently. Right? It describes uh, the rewards and the torments of the hereafter in very sensory terms. That doesn't mean that it is those sensory rewards that are going to be primary. The greatest reward in the hereafter is not one that is mentioned frequently in the Quran in a sensory way. It is the proximity to Allah and the pleasure of Allah. And that's going to give a believer, inshallah, uh, all of us the greatest spiritual reward. But the sensory rewards are mentioned because it uh, is easier for us to understand and compare. Or if you look at the Quran, it describes our uh, relationship with Allah as a transaction, as commerce that can be profitable or can be unprofitable. Now, that's not the reality of our relationship with God because we don't engage in commerce uh, and profit or lose something that doesn't belong to us. And our soul and everything that we have in this world is a gift from God. It belongs to God. But it's compared. So the same thing comes with our food. The Quran says in Surah Abasa, فَلْيَنْفُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامٍ let a person examine his or her food. And the simple tafsir of that is that Allah is saying, look at your actual food. But then, Mufassirina mentioned, and there is a hadith of Imam Bakr as well, where he says that the food refers to something beyond simply your physical food. Just as insan does not refer to my body. Like if I uh, hypothetically were to uh, remove the soul and have a body, then that body would not be called an insan. That body would just be the body of Zayn, or the body of Zayn, but it wouldn't be the person. So insan re refers to both the body and the soul together. Ta'am, that the Quran is saying insan should look at, also refers to the body and the soul together. And Imam Bakr says, that is your knowledge, where do you get your knowledge from? Because your knowledge is going to come uh, and feed your soul. So the Quran is comparing the two. And therefore what it's saying is that your food and your knowledge are to both be viewed as having a nourishing a nourishing impact for the body and for the soul. Don't view them as separate. In other words, you take that verse, you could say that, well, it literally means your food and it figuratively means your knowledge. It's not the interpretation that Imam is giving. He's saying it means your literally, literally, literally both. both yeah. right? Because it's, it comes together. And so your physical health, purity, food, is not just physical or practical, as you said, but it is physical, practical, and also spiritual, and uh, it will have an effect on the soul. But the effects of food on our soul, if I eat too much of one type of food, that is something that uh, we will always be able to appreciate directly. It would require some form of spiritual insight or information from an authoritative uh, religious guide in order for us to know. So why is it that food can become um, linked to knowledge in that way? So why is it that it, food and knowledge are two entirely separate things? I mean, one is very distinctly physical, tangible, sensory. The other one is much more nebulous, try to pin down, you can't. But, but there's two parts that come together to make a person, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the insan. Make up the insan, the ruh and the jism. Right? And the problem is that a lot of times we have a great deal of concern for uh, the wholesomeness, the healthiness, the organicness of our physical food. 
and we don't really care what um, spiritual or intellectual influences will come and uh, modify our personality consciously or unconsciously. Now, if our concern is just to have the best body, that distinction could make sense. But if our purpose in having a healthy body and having a good food is to have the best quality of life, the quality of our life depends on our physical well-being and on our spiritual well-being. And so although food and knowledge are very distinct, they come together, together in both nourishing different aspects of the human being. Our knowledge can affect uh, our physical health. To just use a very simple example, right? uh, uh, I had an experience when uh, I was visiting uh, and I saw the country, I won't name the country right now, uh, but um, there was a breakfast that was served and one of my friends who was sitting with me thought that uh, it was omelette. And so they ate it and they actually praised uh, the taste of the food and then they were informed that it was actually brain. And all of a sudden that knowledge changed their physical health. It was no longer something that they enjoyed eating. So knowledge can affect our physical health. Nothing has changed about the food. It's not tasting different, it's not looking different, no new spices have been added, but just uh, that perception and the image that you have in your soul will now perhaps make you sick or perhaps make you uh, uh, feel very differently. That's a sort of pedestrian example, but our spiritual state and our level of knowledge does affect our body in addition to our spirit. And, and this is a little more difficult to perceive, our physical food and the chemical and hormonal and electrical uh, uh, factors in our body can affect our spirit. Sometimes you can see that easily, sometimes you can't see it easily. So they're very different, but they come together in terms of their relevance to living a good life and a wholesome life. Yeah, so one can impact the other very readily. The food that you eat and your spiritual state. And we can't separate them. We cannot separate them. Even if, in many cases, we don't see the connection. So, you know, I know that if I eat certain fast foods or processed foods, then my skin might break out. I see that readily. But is it going to have a spiritual effect? I don't see it readily. But it does have an effect. And that requires some insight to be able to see. Uh, our soul will break out. And it will be in need of treatment. It will be in need of uh, special care. Now, if that wouldn't be the case when it's uh, skin breaking out not caused by food. Say that it's, it's a skin breakout due to a genetic condition or simply a random disease that occurs. And the soul is the same way. So for example, uh, I might have a physical sickness that is caused by, uh, by say, uh, smoking. And you might smoke, and you don't get emphysema you know, as soon as I do. Right? That's because your body has a different constitution. And that, that comparison does hold true for the soul as well. I can't say that well because you know, uh, I am affected in a certain way by a certain good deed or a certain sin, that everybody is going to be affected in the same way. Now, just because somebody's grandfather lived to the age of 95 and they smoked one pack a day, doesn't mean that smoking is not harmful to the health, even to the health of that person. And the same thing applies with sin. So that comparison, uh, it's not a perfect comparison, but it is very illustrative for us to see both uh, the importance of being concerned for the food that we uh, give to our spirit directly in terms of our knowledge, and the effect of our, not knowledge in spiritual food, but our physical food on the spirit. The, the comparison between the body and the soul, uh, although it's not perfect, but it lines up in many different dimensions. I think that setting it up to where you have your bodily health, which is influenced by what you eat, what you drink, the amount that you exercise, has one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the coin, you have your spiritual soul health. Um, and on that side, that's determined or influenced by your deeds, 
your level of knowledge, kind of what you do, what how you act. Um, I can see that that's a clean, and it's a, it's a pretty image there. You know, this this clean split between the spiritual and the physical. Um, in the same way that the body is harmed by smoking, the soul is harmed by lying. Um, uh, where it becomes more challenging is to see how something that is so distinctly physical can influence something that is completely non-physical. Um, so what I eat influencing the state of my soul. That becomes harder for me to understand because the state of my soul is not physical. Um, the soul is not a physical thing. It can be connected with a physical thing. I mean, no, my and that's the key. The soul is non-physical, but the soul is intimately tied to the body. It's that so connection that's hard connection. to wrap my... It's, it's the, that connection The connection is easy to see in terms of causality. Right? So when I decide to do something, it's starting from my soul, the decision. Okay. And it's visiting itself upon my body. That part is easy to see. Right? No. So the cause that's starting in my soul is non-physical. Right? So there's a, you know, I'm deciding to have a drink of water. The cause that's the seed of the volition is an entirely aphysical thing. However, the ultimate result is a physical one. It's, you know, my hand extending forward to pick up the glass of water. How is it that something that is entirely non-physical can end it's up... It's not entirely non-physical. Oh, so okay. So that's, that's mentioned okay, good. in philosophy, uh, in Islamic philosophy, and it's also something that, uh, and the philosophical explanation is not directly derived from verses of Quran or from a hadith. It's an uh, intellectual exercise by Islamic scholars to try to understand uh, the, you know, cosmic realities and also uh, apply them to Quranic and, and religious teachings. Uh, but what we do find uh, in uh, direct religious texts is a mutual effect between the body and the soul. The way philosophers in Islam have understood that is to say that the soul is kind of halfway between the non-material and the material world. It's not material in its reality, but it's material in its operation. And that's why you'll often look at, uh, say, uh, people who study, uh, even psychology now, a lot of it is, is, is uh, related to, uh, to biology and to, uh, to brain functions. They, they sometimes will study you know, the, the uh, electrical and the chemical, uh, you know, the, the, the hormonal influences on the brain. Mm -hmm. And they will say, well, that is how we can produce happiness and how we can produce sadness. Right? Or, or, and, and decisions. And decisions. And causes. Right? And memories, perhaps. Uh, but what Islam would say is that, yes, that's fine. But that's just the physical element of it. That's not the emotion itself. Just because you can chemically produce a spiritual experience, in no way means that spirituality is purely chemical. That it doesn't have a spiritual element. That's a, a fallacy. Now, how can you prove? Well, by definition, that which is non-material is not going to be measured or proven by material means. Earlier you were saying that it's in between material it's, it's and non material. It's essence is non material. The essence is non material. Now, what philosophers have often said is that in reality, uh, not only is it in between, but progressively it becomes more and more non material. So, a baby, an infant, uh, does not really have a strong sense of self and does not, uh, is not able to remove their soul from. The body. So his, his soul kind of grows. It grows more independent. Now, if we train ourselves through fasting and through worship, our soul can become quite, quite uh, light. Quite, uh, what's a good transition for Latif? Quite uh, refined, perhaps. Quite, uh, uh, quite, yeah, quite, yeah, quite um, rarefied. Right? such that we might be able to perceive spiritual realities quite readily. And in the case of some uh, very pious people, the soul can actually leave the body. 
And that's mentioned in Islamic spirituality and gnosis and experiences of prophets and others that the body is there, it's alive. It still has the ruh and the life. But the soul is traveling somewhere in the heavens or somewhere else in the earth. Because the person has trained their soul for that. The majority of us can't do that. I can't leave my body. But I can somewhat separate myself from just my bodily functions in a way that a lower being or an animal cannot do. And for most of us, that separation comes, the independence comes at the time of death. Time of death. Which is why death can be easy or hard. If I haven't trained my body at all, my soul to be separate from the body, then the process of extracting the soul from the body is very difficult. And we even have uh, 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 the uh, potential that a person will you know, be dragged kicking and screaming from their body. Uh, but it's possible that the, the leaving will be very easy because we've already trained our soul to operate without the crutch of the body in some way. So all of that has a relevance to our diet. But there's a danger. And that danger is that it might make us think that if our body and our soul are so intimately connected, we have to do everything in our power to make sure we don't ever consume something cut up. And so if I have a glass of water in front of me, and I think there's a 1% chance that somebody made that nudges, then I'm going to throw away that water and I'm going to wash the glass 50 times and then, you know, I'm not going to get uh, the water from a source or the food from a source that may have been contaminated. I'll go to your house and you'll bring food and I'll say, you know, where did you buy that meat? Oh, you bought it from that butcher? No, I don't know if he's, you know, if he's actually uh, careful. And so we'll have these kinds of, of issues. And that's, you know, that's not necessarily the right way to be here. So the idea that the body and the soul are connected does not mean that therefore we have to exercise maximum precaution in terms of anything that might come into our body. Yeah, it seems like in those kind of scenarios you start weighing, um, you know, you have a glass of water in front of you and there's going to be some spiritual benefit by being very careful and avoiding touching anything that just, so that's on one side. On the other side, maybe it's going to require your commitment to the spiritual um, wholesomeness will lead you to distrust a close friend or a woman by saying, you know, I offer you a glass of water, but you say, saying, I have to monitor my spiritual well being and I can't accept this water. And then you throw the water in my face because you're upset with, with my rudeness. Justify this one. Right? So that's uh, sometimes you have to balance, but sometimes you can't really balance it. And so I don't think the solution, uh, conceptually you're right, that you can't just assume that the only effect is the harm from that food. You need to balance it with other considerations. But what are those other considerations? Uh, it's not always easy to, on the moment, figure out all the fat inside mathematically, you know, where the, the balance lies. So the best procedure we have is to look at our religious sources and see how much precaution has Islam instructed us to have about a particular thing. And, uh, and then maybe we can go to audience questions after we, we uh, mention maybe one point. Um, but that one point is this. When it comes to precaution, what Islam has emphasized is be careful about whether the food that you are purchasing or you are consuming is halal. So, you know, if I'm not, by halal, I mean halal earnings, right? So if I have you know, transactions that I've engaged in where uh, I'm selling my house and the buyer says, is there anything wrong with the house? And I say, oh, this is in pristine condition. Uh, all of the appliances I knew I've just had you know, uh, brought up to code. And I, I, I exaggerate a little bit about how uh, good the house is. And so I get top dollar. Now, if I falsify, the money I earn is haram. If I slightly exaggerate, is the money haram? Well, to the extent that I have not been upfront, then there is a shubha, there is a uh, potential uh, deficiency in the earnings. 
if I take that and I buy the most organic uh, beef and I slaughter it myself, right, facing the qibla, and I say uh, the dhikr properly, I do everything properly, right? there's no shubha as to whether it's the biha. But there is a little bit of a shubha in terms of did I cut corners and earn the money. That is where Islam says you want to be careful with the earnings. But when it comes to the actual Ladiha, we don't find in Islam that you're supposed to take all those precautions. It wasn't the practice of the Imams or the instruction of the Imams to take those precautions. In fact, sometimes they said the opposite. That if you're dealing with a Muslim, trust them. Uh, don't ask. Don't uh, uh, go through those processes. So don't just try to balance it and say, well, I'm going to offend this person that counts for you know 30% of my decision making and the spiritual because we don't know. Based it on the teachings we have in Islam. When it comes to halal earnings, be as careful as you can. Right? Even more than the red line. When it comes to the biha, don't be as careful as you can. No one's asked you for it. One will affect the soul. The other may or may not affect the soul as much as they think it does. And it's always interesting to see people who are careless about, for example, paying their religious obligations, and so they have stolen property, but they'll go and make sure that the meat is from uh, a very uh, reputable sources. most reputable source. It's exactly that works. Yes, I have a question. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about the connection between soul and body? Because uh, we have in the Quran, uh, for example, for the uh, that ayah which was about the ayah to Tathir, it says that the Ahl al don't have rights. In other word, uh, in other uh, words, we have uh, that Lahm al Khanzir has rights. So if rights is a spiritual uh, word that uh, some specific people don't have that, why we have this attribute to the um, something completely materialistic, like lahm al So uh, I want to know a little bit more about the disconnection between this. Uh, the Quran says that, uh, that uh, physical things and spiritual things can both be, uh, be um, uh, termed rids. So al-than or uh, um, idols are also rids. Uh, when the Qur'an applies it to something physical, it doesn't mean the Qur'an is saying it is exclusively physical. Or when the Qur'an applies it to something spiritual, it doesn't mean the Qur'an is saying it is exclusively spiritual. And that's what ties into our earlier discussion. In the Qur'an, there is not a distinction between physical and spiritual as being two entirely different realities. We think of it that way. We think of it as being something um, separate. You say that I can deal with my body and I can deal with my soul. But in Islam, when we do wudu, we're trying to purify our body and our spirit. The wudu is both a bodily and a spiritual purification, all in one. When we avoid rids, we're avoiding spiritual and bodily uh, impurities and the, the reality of them is not that they're necessarily, it's not a cut and dry either or, or a black and white distinction. Uh, and that's why uh, when we talk about, for example, uh, idols, there is a spiritual impurity in idolatry. But it is also the case that the existence of idols and idol worship may physically contaminate the environment. Now, by physically contaminated, it's not that you'll be able to measure it, you know, with uh, with some kind of uh, yeah, uh, kind of like a radioactive meter. That with the radioactive meter, you measure, you know, the germs or the, the contamination of it. But the environment itself may be physically contaminated. And we do find that uh, it's maybe a, a considered to be um, far-fetched today that if I commit a sin, God might withhold the rain. If I do good, God might send abundant rains. Right? But that's uh, been part of uh, religious teaching before Islam and in Islam. And if you think about it, then it shouldn't be far-fetched. Not to say that every time we have a good rain, it's because of a good, 
good deed every time we have a drought is because of a sin. That's not what God says. But what he is saying is that your good deeds affect your physical environment, and your bad deeds affect your physical environment. If the physical is basically preparatory for the spiritual, that makes sense. It's not far-fetched. I can't say that there's an earthquake, therefore something committed adultery. I can't say that, you know, uh, we had a wonderful harvest, therefore uh, people were saying their prayers on time. I can't make that one-to-one -one connection. But I can say that there is a connection, there is an influence. So, uh, one more question about the, your explanation about the uh, pro uh, progressive uh, progress of the soul. Uh, so, as we uh, practice our about that, we, we're going to see that our soul is more independent from the, our body. So, but it doesn't seem self consistent because uh, when it gets more independent, then uh, the your interaction with the uh, physical stuff should be less important. But when you your soul is uh, very independent from your body, if you do a, a simple scene, or after they say that okay, you will drop a lot. So if it's really independent of the body after some practice, so why some uh, physical scene gonna affect on the soul? So it doesn't seem well, there's no such thing as a physical sin. Every sin comes from a decision of our mind and our heart. No, like, so, like food, haram food. If I eat haram food, then uh, if it's deliberately eating pork, for example, or consuming alcohol, then the grave sin is not the body, but it is the, uh, the decision I made to, uh, to do a bad deed. It's a spiritual sin. If it's accidental, if I accidentally eat pork thinking it is halal, or I go to a Muslim and I trust that they give, are serving me halal food, and they deliberately or inadvertently serve me halal meat, that's no sin. And it will not affect my soul as a sin will affect my soul. But it might affect my body. There, there might be sickness that comes if it's contaminated. And because the soul can be somewhat uh, independent of the body, but it's never going to be disconnected. Just as there might be a physical harm, there might be a harm to the spirit as well. That harm to the spirit is not going to be a sin. I'm not responsible for it because I didn't do it deliberately. But it might still be there. Right? If, I, if I see a very traumatic accident in front of my eyes, I wasn't a voyeur, I wasn't looking for it, I just happened to see it. If it's going to affect my body, I might throw up. Right? And it's going to affect my soul, I might be traumatized. It doesn't mean that I'm culpable, but it does have an effect. So the soul is never independent of the body fully. Until death. Until death. Yeah. And even after death. So it's possible that even after death, there is still a little bit of a... Of a vicarious connection. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where like I was standing right here and I move and all of a sudden you know a wall falls down or a car smashes into that area and I lose my breath. Right? Because I have I'm not directly connected to that spot. I wasn't harmed at all. But I, I, I'm unable to think that that I was entirely safe. It takes me a while. So the body and soul even after death Although they are separated, they still have a little bit of, in the end, the body was the whole of that soul so for a very long time. It, it remembers its old vehicle. It remembers the vehicle. And the nature of the old vehicle. Yeah, and it might still be traumatized by it somewhat. That's one reason why, uh, or perhaps is one reason why uh, we've been told to give special honor to the body of Muslim after death. Right? Yeah. Not necessarily the only reason, but that could be one potential reason. So we have about 15, 20 minutes left. Um, I'd like to shift gears to a different topic under the same umbrella subject. Um, so here we, we're discussing the impacts of the body on the soul and vice versa. So how what you eat impacts your spiritual state and how your spiritual state can impact what you eat. Um, the the two-way connection between body and soul. Um, 
moving on to a, a different topic, um, this one's a little more specific. Also the notion of head out of food and more to our bodies. Um, alcohol in the Quran and what exactly the Quran has to say about alcohol and the way that it appears in the Quran. Um, so one thing that has interested me for a while is that when it comes to the al um, the meat of swine, of pork, the verses are pretty clear. Um, so so sort of to the Nahal would be verse 115. Very clear cut. We've made this is from the, the pig fell or the, the Sahih International Translation. He has only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine. And then the Dr. Pigfall's translation is also quite similar to that. Um, and then also for the Anam, you have another, you have the, the, the concept of Haram, Harama, Nahmal Khanzir. And then same thing with uh, Sultan Baqarah, Ayah 173. Um, when it comes to alcohol, it's not the same direct Haram alaykum al Khan. Um, we receive, on more than one occasion, a more indirect uh, condemnation of alcohol. Um, the first one comes up, so to Baqarah, the cow, uh, verse 219. Yes, alunaka um, so, the Pink Fellow translation, they question thee about strong drink and games of chance. Say in both there is great sin, ithmun kabir, and some utility for men, omanafa and nas. But the sin of them is greater than their usefulness. Wa ithmahuma akbar Um So, and then from there it, it doesn't even say that, it, it doesn't damn or make alcohol forbidden. It simply says there is more bad than good. So, and this is the question then is, why is the Quran here more indirect when it comes to alcohol than when it comes to pork? Whereas practically, in the way that we act, we put them kind of on the same par. Like a Muslim does not drink, a Muslim does not consume alcohol. Um, in fact, sometimes Ahmad Khanzi is given, a, it's, or the, the alcohol is given a, a stronger tongue. For example, I mean, I, I've heard and told that if you're at a table and there's alcohol, a Muslim should avoid sitting until the alcohol is being consumed. But if you're with a group of non-Muslims and one of them is, is eating something with pork, you're not eating pork, it's okay for you to be at a table where someone's eating something not halal. But you shouldn't be at a table where someone's consuming alcohol. So it seems like there might be a, um, a disconnect there. A second eye that I want, I want to bring into discussion um, is uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 90. Um, ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu innama al-khamru wa al-maysru wa al-ansab wa al-azanam wa rijsun min amil al-shaytan. Rijsan. Rijsun min amil al-shaytan. Yes, Rijsan. Rijsun min amil al-shaytan. Fajtanabuhu la'allakum tuflihum. So, um, the Big Fellow translation, O ye who believe, O ye strong drink and games of chance and divining errors are an infamy of Satan's handiwork, Amin al Shaytan. So avoid them such that you may succeed. We'll eat it. What caught my attention here was that the, the conjugation of Fajtan Abuhu is singular. It's not saying like avoid them. It's saying avoid it. Which would imply that maybe it's talking about Satan's handiwork. So avoid Satan's handiwork. Not avoid the previously listed intoxicants, gambling, um, and, and the, the games and chance to the dividing arrows. This is another place where the Quran is being oddly indirect. Because well, it, it, it could have been. The Joe Brunner point. Uh, that you're raising is a valid one. Uh, one thing that sometimes we're not sufficiently conscious of 
It's relevant for food, but it's a much broader point in our study of the Quran. This is uh, a matter of tafsir. The Quran is a book that is intimately involved with human psychology. And so when you want to look at the, uh, the, the meaning of the Quran and interpret it and understand it, don't try to get you know, a tafsir, what does it really mean? What is it referring to? If God wanted to just spell things out, God had the vocabulary and he had uh, the eloquence to be able to spell things out. But he says things sometimes ambiguously, sometimes uh, indirectly, because he wants to, uh, to affect our psychology in a certain way. Sometimes he's clear. For example, that's you know, black and white. I mean, it's, it's really clear cut. And so the question is really, why? Then surely there's a reason it's been discussed why, when it comes to alcohol, it's a much more roundabout. With alcohol, the interesting thing is that, first of all, alcohol was a reason why many people were reluctant to become Muslim. There is uh, there are a number of people in Islamic history who, um, uh, in the time of the Prophet, who said that uh, we're willing to become Muslim. Can you just give us a dis dispensation so we can consume alcohol? Can we consume alcohol for a year? And the Prophet said, no, Islam is packaged, take it all away to be there. So alcohol was a real challenge for many people uh, in the time of the Prophet. And even after Islam, there was a debate among the companions about whether all forms of intoxicating beverages are haram or not. Okay, so and even some of the companions uh, had this uh, misunderstanding that, well, you can drink, just don't get drunk. Right? Or certain types of beverages which are not you know, very strongly intoxicating, they might be okay. So the Quran, when it talks about alcohol, or it talks about kham, or wine, uh, it talks about it in a way that uh, recognizes that it's not as psychologically easy for an individual or for a culture to, uh, to uh, remove itself from both the consumption and the culture of intoxication. So it's the historical context. Here. The historical context, the psychology of the of the the uh, ummah at the time, the the at the time. The and it's also a, a lesson for us in terms of uh, the importance of gradually increasing religious knowledge and practice. If we're talking to somebody, uh, you know, who is in a very uh, spiritually bad place or a different mindset, I can't just say that. Well, quit cold turkey. Right? They might need to quit. Uh, but it might not be possible for me to uh, assert a immediate break. It might be a family member, it might be a friend, and I might need to learn a lesson from that graduated method. But what is uh, what is uh, important for us to uh, to be aware of in terms of, for example, the Quranic verses on Kham. The Quran says that there is ithm, and ithm means sin. On the other side, it doesn't ever give a, myth, a mitigating uh, uh, counterpoint. Ithmun kabiru wa manafiyon. There is sin, and it's not well. There's non-sin. There's benefit. A lot of things that have sinfulness in them have certain benefits, right? not just alcohol or gambling. So what the Quran is saying is, if your decision making is material, material, then you might actually say, well, let me try to get the benefits. Right? Some of these studies now are, are questionable, but at one time they used to say a little bit of uh, wine a day can prevent, it's good, it's good for your heart, and that's actually questionable, but let's say, assume for the sake of argument it's good. Uh, I believe if you live in a very cold climate, sometimes consumption of alcohol can prevent frostbite or can prevent you from feeling as cold. It's also a viable anesthetic. If nothing else is around, and you need to have surgery, 
Um, and that, that's, uh, it's, it's a, it can be used as a medical substance in certain circumstances. So perhaps as an anesthetic, uh, I mean, you know, if your decision making is material, then yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, gambling can fund your public school system, right? And alcohol can have these, uh, these benefits. But if your decision making is as a believer, then nothing can override or can compensate or can mitigate so grave sin is explicit and is clear. Uh, so the Quran is trying to put a explicit distinction between a material decision making, which is the type of person who says that, you know, pigs in the time of the Prophet, they were perhaps dirty animals and they had certain kinds of diseases and we can have a sterile environment, you know, and we can, we can raise hygienic, healthy pigs, and we can test the meat. If it's just a matter of a material decision, you can probably do that. But if you're concerned, if you are a believer, and your concern is about ithm and thawab, then uh, that is a separate uh, framework for looking at things. Yes, yeah, so no degree of manafa can overcome if you know, just kind of the way it's set up, is that manafa is a benefit, if is a strong sin, so if there truly is an absolute manafit, manfara, mm -hmm. then the, the sin will be removed. So let's say, for example, that my life depends on a medicine that, require, that has alcohol. Yeah. My life depends on consumption of pork. Then there's no if. Mm -hmm. you, you have to in our own. If you have to add in our own, know that it's haram, but it's not haram for you. But as long as there is if, then no amount of manfara will be able to overcome or undo the damage of that sin. If the, the, the manfara is overriding, then it will remove the sin altogether. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about the word hum. So in some translations, it's given strong drink. Other translations, it's given just wine. Um, sometimes it's called um, an intoxicant. So, kham is, you know, is a to ferment, right? Is it? Kham literally means to cover up, to cover up a person's intellect. That's the literal sense. Uh, but it's used to, uh, to refer specifically to why. So, the, there are a hadith of Abdul Bayt that say uh, the Quran forbade why. But the Prophet forbade any kind of intoxicant. And what that means is, uh, not that the Prophet did it from his own uh, volition, but that Allah had given the Prophet certain authority to uh, take a specific instruction from the Quran and to put it in a certain form that's binding on us. It's a legally binding uh, obligation. And the Prophet did it with Salat, for example. The Quran simply says, do zakat, do sajda, do ruku. And the Prophet gave it the form that we pray in today. Uh, the Prophet did it with certain foods as well, uh, with uh, wine. The Quran forbade wine. But the Prophet said that if there is a form of beer, for example, made from barley or made from dates or made from anything else, made from wheat, that is also forbidden. And so anything which intoxicates which uh, covers up our intellect and comes around on that basis. In medical context, so, so now in this division, hum becomes a, a much wider term than, much just, wider term than, than just alcohol. Alcohol or Now any type of substance that can cloud the judgment uh, or alter the judgment um, can, event, can, can possibly fall under the umbrella of hum. Um, but the distinction is going to have to be made on the basis of uh, uh, not a uh, fine-tuned uh, scientific definition, but on the basis of custom. So, uh, you know, fruits and uh, normal non-alcoholic juices, if you were to, to analyze, they have a little percentage of alcohol in them. It's not haram, it's not najis. <coughs> the standard is something that uh, is based on what our and common custom can understand. Um, I think we want to open it up perhaps yeah. to, to the audience as well if there's any questions. I believe we have about 10 minutes or so left. So if there's any questions on, on 
it's general issues of food, or even on some uh, more specific questions? Let me tell you a specific question. Uh, it is said that, I mean, it, I don't know how strong, how reliable is this narration about that uh, a Jewish woman brought some meat to the Prophet and he had it. And they say again that that meat intoxicated, was intoxicated, so, so he was, it was a reason to part with his pass away. So my question is not really about whether or not he passed away because of that meat, but it's about did Prophet had a meat from a Jewish person? So. So it goes back to the question of, you know, having the Tawam of To be very brief, that, that incident is reported that the Prophet was brought uh, food prepared by a Jewish woman and uh, it was uh, poisoned. It's reported, but it's a historical report. Right. And so there's doubt about uh, details and authenticity. It's possible that some details were missing. Uh, even today, if you go to places where there's a mixed Muslim and non-Muslim population, then, you know, if a Muslim has a Jewish neighbor and they're preparing a meal for the Jewish neighbor, then they will often uh, perhaps bring the food in from a Jewish cook so they can serve it. Or if there's a Hindu and a Muslim uh, who are uh, close to one another and the Hindu knows the dietary restrictions of the Muslim, they might have the food prepared or they might buy zabiha in order to be able to serve it. So it's possible uh, that if this incident is true, uh, it wasn't non zabiha meat. Now, I'm saying that's a possibility because the incident itself and the narrations are not narrated in any kind of strong source for us to be able to fully trust the narration. Uh, but there's a better answer than this. And the better answer is that if you look at, there's a hadith of Abu Bakr, where he says, I wish I had asked the Prophet about the food of Ahlul Kitab. There's three things that Abu Bakr says that he wished he asked the Prophet. One of them, uh, I believe it was a matter of inheritance. One of them was, of course, you know, is there supposed to be somebody succeeding the Prophet? And one of them was, uh, can you eat the food of Abu Qatam? Now, what that hadith tells us is that a, a companion was ignorant of that ruling. Remember that the rulings were being, uh, uh, were being uh, taught gradually. So alcohol was forbidden publicly in Medina. For many years in Mecca and many years in Medina, Muslims did uh, consume alcohol. And either it was not forbidden or it was forbidden, but they didn't know it. Uh, inheritance uh, laws were, pro were taught in Medina. Um, alcohol and uh, interest was forbidden in Medina. So there was a time, even in Medina, when Muslims took interest bearing loans. So if I have a hadith that say Abdul Rahman ibn Auf borrowed money at interest from uh, Talha, that might be a valid hadith. It doesn't mean that it's uh, acceptable at the end of the Prophet's mission. So the better answer is to say that if that is true, then it would be an incident that uh, happened at the time of Khaybar. Right? In the intervening three years, the Prophet may have forbidden it. The fact that Abu Bakr had that question gives us an indication that this is one of those unsettled questions. Muslims didn't know. Right? The fact that he wanted to ask means he wasn't sure it was haram. It also shows he wasn't sure it was haram. The Prophet may have forbidden it, but Abu Bakr never found out. And that's why it's interesting that the Shia have basic unanimity that you could not eat uh, food that was slaughtered by a non-Muslim. But in the Sunni school, schools, there is a difference of opinion. The Hanafis agree with the Shi'i school. Hanbalis and uh, Shafi'is and Malikis, they have a different opinion. Right? That difference of opinion in the Sunni school, it kind of reflects that uncertainty that we find in that hadith. And that's a better answer than to try to figure out a historical incident, which in the end, we have no way of knowing conclusively. I think we have perhaps time for one more question, I think. Sure. Yeah. Yes, uh, there's, there's also a hadith that it says that there is no shafa in a haram. So my question is that if, if alcohol or whatever is going to give you health in a medical... There's no, to be very, very brief, there's no <laughs> cure in that which is haram. Uh -huh. But sometimes that which is haram is not haram anymore. Uh -huh. So something might be a substance forbidden in itself 
But under certain circumstances, it's no longer haram. And in that case, it might be the cure. And so that's, uh, that hadith is not contradicted. And I think we have one last question. Yeah. Related to a previous question, we have a verse in Quran, Ta'ama Ahle Kitab Hilum Lakum Wa Ta'ama Kitab So, and I think we don't have time for that, but in these cases that... No, we do. So, are you saying that, does this hadith make it, does this ayah make it permissible to eat the food of Ahle Kitab? My question is that something, sometimes some, some things are um, somehow make clear in the Quran, in terms of when you read it, it says, okay, so how can God say say to you other than, other than this that you no, can okay. So let me read, read so, the answer. Yes. The Quran says, A lot of people have this misconception that because the Quran says the food of Ahlul Kitab is halal for you, therefore, uh, uh, if they slaughter it, it should be halal. Right? The food of Ahlul Kitab, does the food of Ahlul Kitab eat pork, cons consist of pork? Yes, it does. Christians eat pork. Therefore, does this verse make pork halal? No. If the Ahlul Kitab come and say Korean or, or Chinese Christians, if they eat dog, does that mean that we should say the dog becomes halal? No. The Quran says that you are not allowed to eat pork, even if Christians eat it. The Quran says you are not allowed to eat blood, even if it's Ta'am wa Ahlul Kitab. The Quran says you are not allowed to eat that which was not slaughtered with the name of Allah even if Christians and Jews eat it. So this verse is not giving us permission to eat everything Ahlul Kitab has slaughtered. It's telling us the fact that it comes from Ahlul Kitab is not an obstacle. It's a difference. It's possible for me to say, look, I don't care if it is, you know, the, the most pure food. If it sources Ahlul Kitab, you have to avoid it. You know, the most uh, hygienic spring water that comes from, you know, a spring in the Himalayas. If it comes to you from Ahlul Kitab, you can't eat it. There is that potential question that comes in the mind. And the Quran says two things. You can take it from Ahlul Kitab, but it has to be intrinsically halal. And you can give it to Ahlul Kitab. And the best evidence for this is that the Quran also says, Your food is allowed for them. I mean, are Ahlul Kitab really going to ask Prophet Muhammad, are we allowed to eat camel meat? Are we allowed to eat shrimp? No. They're not finding out what is halal and what is not halal. Right? The Quran is not telling the Muslims, you can eat what they eat, and telling the Christians, you can eat what the Muslims eat. It's telling the Muslims, selling to Christians is okay, buying from Christians is okay. Selling to Jews is okay, buying from Jews is okay. Feeding them is okay, getting fed by them is okay. But in both cases, it has to be intrinsically halal. What is intrinsically halal? This verse is not specified. And with that, we have to conclude. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.